right. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll upload this to YouTube and so that you can reference it. Feel free to share this with your friends, people, anyone that you think can benefit from it, uh, by all means, because I mean, it. so just a little history. Back when I started keeping bees again here in Washington State, people kept asking me to teach classes. And one of the first classes I taught, it was over at Gate Schoolhouse here in Rochester. And I got about five minutes into it and I was like, oh my gosh, there's a lot to know about beekeeping. <laughs> and even, even when I was just doing a little bit of prep for tonight, I was like, it's so, it's so easy to get overwhelmed, but there's no need to because it's, you know, the whole idea of this session tonight is exactly what it's called, Beekeeping 101, just your basic, basic information, basic stuff. And the thing is, too, is that it's a learning curve. And like anything worthwhile, uh, it takes a while to, to just kind of get into the flow of it. To the point where actually I'm just getting ready to... Uh, to upload a uh, YouTube video here for our YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com forward slash high five bees. Uh, if you haven't checked that out, please, please do so. Because uh, what we do is throughout the entire year, about once a week, we'll upload a video. The whole purpose being to kind of give you an idea of what you need to be looking for, what you need to be doing in our area with your bees. And so that's just a another just free resource that we want to provide for you. But getting back to this perpetual learning curve. So since August, and this will, this should instill a lot of confidence in you and in, in your teacher this evening. Since August uh, of last year till now, we lost around 50% of our colonies. Now, what's more embarrassing is that I know exactly why. And what's even more embarrassing is it's because I didn't follow my own advice. <laughs> if there's one thing that you need to take away from this whole thing, and I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you this is the single most important takeaway of, of anything in beekeeping right now. And that very important takeaway is this mites. Varroa mites do not, you have to be absolutely obsessive about keeping your bees clean with mites. What happened with us is a bit of laziness on my part, as well as complacency. Uh, what happened is our bees were looking great. We were following the treatment regimen that, uh, that I can send out again. It's a calendar of, of the treatments we do. And because we were following it to a T, our bees looked great. When it came to summer, came to the fall, I had my guys, I thought, you know, I'm gonna save them some labor. The bees look great. Let's just treat the top box of the hive instead of the whole two call. You know, even saying it now, it's like, it's so stupid, but whatever the case, I justified it at the time. Long story short, between that and then also taking for granted that my mite levels were going to be okay. We tested hives. We tested, but I was not on top of it the way that I should have. And, and there was a bunch of other large beekeepers, so we lost around 500 hives. Uh, there was a couple of other beekeepers on eastern Washington that lost like 3,000 hives each. It would have been very easy for me to have blamed it on, well, it's just winter, just blah, blah, blah. We took samples of the, be the dead colony, sent it into the USDA, and they came back with one of the colonies, or one of the samples rather had 17 mites per 100 bees. The other had five mites per 100 bees. The other one was 1.5. And your treatment threshold for treating for varroa mites is two mites per hundred bees. And we'll get into all of that here. But anyway, long story short, the biggest thing to set you up for success is make sure that you're on top of mites and uh, doing a treatment that really works. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, anyway, okay, 
So a couple of resources for those of you who are just starting is um, there's a American Bee Journal, which is $28 a, a year. It's a once a month publication. Uh oh, it's not gonna, there we go, aha. And great, just absolutely great resource, American Bee Journal. I mean, when you think about how much money you have to invest now to just even get started with one hive, 28 bucks for a year of just really, really good uh, studies, good data, good articles on just what our industry is doing, as well as just keeping bees healthy. It's well, well worth the investment. Um, we've also here, I don't know, we have a retail store that we opened up last June here in Rochester, and uh, we've got some educational books in. I was actually just leaping through this one here. Uh, it's uh, the beekeeper, Beekeeper's Problem Solver, which it's 100, 100 common problems that you come across in beekeeping. And it actually has some really great practical information in it. And I actually want to give this away uh, in just a little bit, as well as this cute little stuffed bee, which uh, I've been able to keep these alive. So that's incredible. <laughs> but we're going to do a little giveaway here in just a little bit, just to have fun. Um, anyways, so getting into beekeeping, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, oh, I see somebody saying about uh, it lagging. Has the internet, it, am I still good or has it been... Uh, don't want to yell at me there in the chat box and make sure that uh, you're good. I'm good. It cool. seems to be cutting out at the most important parts, but you're good. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta gotta love it, right? Yeah, that seems about right for internet connection. Um, when it comes to beekeeping 101, you know, like I said, biggest thing is mites, and we're going to get to, you know, the main treatment that. I recommend, and a very common question and a very good question is, should we treat our bees when we get them? Our nukes that uh, many of you uh, are gonna be picking up have been treated already. Uh, with that said, I have no issue whatsoever with encouraging people to do another round of treatment just to make sure their bees are super clean going into the summer, and, uh, but it's not necessary. The next most important treatment that you're going to want to do is the end of July, beginning of August. That is probably, without exaggeration, that little bit of advice is probably the second most important thing that you'll hear, <laughs> that you'll hear. Um, it's really, really important to treat your bees for mites the end of July, beginning of August in our area. The treatment that we use and have seen the most consistent results with is the Apovar. And we've had more and more people ask us to carry it. So we finally have it here in the store, but you can get it from any of the bee, bee supplier places, A-P-I-V-A-R. And, um, but that's a really, really important treatment. I, I don't wanna to get too sidetracked with that part because we'll do another one of these uh, here coming up later in the spring and then we'll do one in the summer as well, talking about those things right now. But uh, yeah, the mites, the mites are a big thing and you want to, in order to set your bees up properly for wintering, you wanna make sure that they're super clean going into the fall and winter, and that's one of the parts of it. Now, the other thing that is often common, and then I'm gonna start getting to the questions here that were emailed, people ask me all the time, do you get stung? And the answer, and I'm sure none of you will be shocked by this, is yes, I get stung. And it always hurts, it sucks. Uh, when I first started beekeeping, I had these, you know, old school guys that used to go out. I mean, we'd, we'd go out work with thousands of hives just in our T-shirts and a veil. Uh, one guy would wear shorts. You know, I mean, he was, he was braver than me. Um, and we would get stung maybe a handful of times throughout the day. I mean, it was pretty amazing we didn't get stung more. 
but it just also reiterates how awesome bees are to work with. But one thing that I have never experienced, even though these uh, old school guys would always tell me this, they'd always tell me, Kevin, when you're a real beekeeper, it becomes like a mosquito bite. Well, you know, thousands and thousands of bee stings later, I can maybe think of one or two that felt like a mosquito bite, <laughs> but otherwise they always hurt. And one of the worst things was the swelling. I would get, you know, I mean, I'd get stung on my hand, especially like around my knuckles or the top of my hand. My hand would look like a latex glove that had been blown up for like two or three days. And, you know, I'd go out and have to work with the bees with both my hands just blown up like this. So don't, you know, it's perfectly normal anxiety. It's most likely going to happen. However, if you haven't been stung by a honeybee before, or if it's been a while, it's not a bad idea to have some liquid Benadryl on hand just in case. Uh, our oldest daughter had gotten stung a couple of times when she was around two, three years old, no issue. And then one time she was out at our bee yard with us and got stung and went into anaphylactic shock. Fortunately, it was a very slow progression. And so we were actually able to get her to the ER <clears throat> right when it was just starting to get bad. So, but you know, it's just one of those things. You just wanna be prepared and you wanna be safe about that. Necessary equipment that you want. Now, beekeeping has become, this is an absolutely wonderful time for our industry because there's never been more attention on the importance of honeybees and the role that they play in our food supply and just, just nature in general. Uh, however, the issue with that too has been that kind of like, you know, all of these little accessories that you can get for your chihuahua or your pet dog or cat or whatever else. There's a lot of things that you can get for your bees that are marketed that they're for your bees, but don't necessarily do anything for your bees or they're just not necessary. And so it's really easy to go in and just spend a ton of money on a bunch of stuff that, you know, doesn't really matter to your bees. However, I mean, if it's something you're wanting to do, something that's going to make your experience with it better, I mean, you know, by all means. But uh, let's just kind of cover the basics here. I'm going to share my, uh, share my screen real quick. Aha, there we go. And probably take that off there. Okay. You guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. So let's go over here. So here... Here's another thing, and I, I hate to sound like I'm plugging our store, but it's just, it's one of those things that, you know, because we sell nukes and we've been selling nukes for a few years now, people ask us, you know, if we carry these things. So we've started doing this. Um, any of the large bee suppliers or even local suppliers uh, have, we usually have starter kits. These are the starter kits that we carry. And this is really all you need to start a smoker. You know, your smoker, a veil, a pair of gloves, that's again optional. Uh, however, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up. If you want to get into a full suit uh, so you're comfortable working with your bees, do that. And as you get more and more comfortable, you may choose to, you know, wear less and less, or you may be more comfortable just staying with a full. It, this is one of those things that, you know, the important thing is you enjoy your bees. These little insects are some of the most incredible things. You will fall in love with them. And just like any type of proper romance, you will have days where you never want to see them again and have days where you wonder if they love you and if you love them, but it'll always come back to you loving your bees. And that it's just that they're, they're absolutely wonderful. And so don't stress yourself out. Uh, you know, just, just whatever you got to do to enjoy your bees and not go in with a bunch of anxiety. Uh, that's the right choice for you. Uh, we got a little, there's a little starting book uh, on just some of the basics. Hive tool. So hive tool, smoker, veil, gloves. That, that is really the other thing that I would add that's handy to have is a bee brush. 
not necessary, but it's just nice to have. I mean, they're like what eight bucks or something, and they're just nice to have to brush the bees. Um, one thing you can do, I still use this in the field because I don't like having to physically carry a brush with me because you know we're we're working a lot of hives. We're running uh, this past year. We're running around twelve hundred hives, and we'll be back up to that number again, twelve to fifteen hundred uh, this year. So. We're going through the, a lot of bees. And so if you need something, you can actually just grab some tall grass, tall meadow grass, the softer the better, and use that as a bee brush. But anyway, as far as the actual beehive itself, here's kind of a decent breakdown of what you're wanting to now in that kit, you know, you get the deep and you get the, uh, bottom board and you get the little entrance reducer uh, inner cover lid i would suggest to this picture actually gives a pretty good depiction i'd suggest to have at least a couple more boxes on hand so three or four extra boxes on hand with uh with frames and you know obviously a foundation once again, you can get into the weeds of, you know, well, what type of foundation or what, as long as the foundation has beeswax on it, we don't really, we've switched entirely to using plastic foundation that's coated with beeswax. Um, it's, it's easier to install. I mean, before you would have to heat these little wires to, anyways, it, it was a pain in the butt and I did way too many of them. Plastic foundation is what we use now. Plastic frames, personal preference. A lot of this stuff, uh, it's just personal preference stuff. Um, pros and cons on that, that's, that's a whole other discussion, but nothing of too big a significance. The other thing too, to uh, keep in mind when you have these boxes is just uh, uh, people will ask, you know, what about, you know, do I want to use deep boxes, which is your standard? I mean, that's what you see here is this is a deep box. Um, you've got, you know, medium boxes. That's a medium honey super. And then you have shallow honey supers. Again, it's a personal preference. You know, here's, here's a picture. Okay? You, know, you have your honey supers. And personal preference. Um, we like to use deeps for every part of our hive. And the reason that we like to do that is because then the equipment is interchangeable. Um, you know, if you have some frames of whatever, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can think of a hundred different little manipulations, but if you have different size frames because of different super sizes, Say you want to bring some honey down, you know, into where the brood chamber is or the bottom deep is. It's just easier if all the frames are the same size and the equipment's the same size. But also, if you get honey your first year, honey is very heavy. And so uh, when you pull honey or when you're harvesting honey, uh, it's very rare. It is very rare to find people who are disappointed with a shallow super because I mean, it's just, it's, it's less weight. I mean, even a shallow super full of honey is still probably gonna be 30 pounds, 40 pounds. Uh, a deep, a deep of a honey super full of honey is, can be 75, 80, 90 pounds. So that's kind of, you know, the most practical practical thing is um, just, you know, what kind of weight uh, are you wanting to, what's your physical capabilities of really using this equipment? And so that's kind of what you want to use as your reference point. But, uh, you know, once again, you know, personal preference on, you've got wooden boxes, which are, you know, standards, what we use. Uh, you've got these uh, kind of polyurethane boxes, whatever. Once again, I, you know, it's just the basics of you want some place where the bees can do what bees do. And a lot of the different variations aren't going to make a significant difference. 
I'm going to go back to that first point, and that is as long as your bees are healthy, and what underlines that is your mites and your nutrition, mites and nutrition, mites and nutrition. Um, it's, you know, uh, Michael Palmer, who uh, actually, let me put his name here in the chat, because for those of you who are wanting to get a little bit deeper into some of the science of like queen rearing and just beekeeping. And this guy is really, really interesting. And he has a lot of great lectures on YouTube, but he has a famous saying that it's not, uh, it's not the box, it's what's in the box and really is true. I mean, you can have equipment that's uh, falling apart, but if your bees are healthy, they don't care, uh, you know, short of, you know, obviously them getting rained on or some, anyways, you, you know what I'm trying to say here. Um, getting your bees, there was uh, one of the questions was as far as what, what do I do with this box of bees, this nuke, nucleus, which by the way, that's, that's where the name comes from. What, what do I do with it? One of the first bee classes that I did I told everyone in the room, I said, upon getting your nuke, hold it in your hands firmly and shake it vigorously. And if it buzzes, you know the bees are, bees are alive. And uh, after, you know, everyone looked rather shocked. I said, no, no, I'm just joking. You don't want to shake the box. But here's, uh, here's kind of a, if you go to our website, which is just uh, high five bees, high5bees.com and you go to I mean you can follow this link or wherever you just go follow the 2022 nuke sales order um, there's going to be you know okay you know here's our nukes and the prices that starter kit um, a brief message from our owner which happens to be me and then here at the bottom how to install a nuke and it's like a seven minute video and it'll give you an idea. And let me uh, fast forward here and I'll just explain the process really quickly. When you get your nuke, when you get your box of bees, you're going to have a yellow plug here. Oh, actually, no, what am I talking about? You're gonna actually, uh, we're using the, uh, the nuke, uh, pro nuke boxes. So they're actually gonna look different than this. So. Uh, but whatever, on the nuke, on the pro nuke boxes, you have a plastic gate that keeps the bees in. When you get your bees home, one of the key things that you want to do is orient the entrance of the nuke to the same side as the entrance to the hive you're installing them in. And the reason you're wanting to do that is because obviously you're going to be putting these frames into the hive, and if they already are oriented in flying back and forth into the entrance that you've opened, when you take the nuke away that the bees came in and you've installed them into this colony, they, that's a close enough proximity that they're gonna pick up on the pheromones, the nasonoff glands, the scent that the bees release, that they're gonna be able to find that entrance and just fly into there. When you get your nuke home, very, very important, very, very important. Get your nuke home as soon as possible. And uh, don't cover it with anything. Don't try to uh, throw a blanket over it. Uh, if anything, crank your AC, crank your AC to high and uh, just keep those bees as cool as possible. Um, <laughs> there was a guy that, uh, called me, I think it was last year, and he says, Kevin, uh, he left a voicemail. He says, Kevin, I got my nuke comb, opened it, and all the bees are dead. I want my money back. And so I called him back, and I said, I said, you know, what did the bees look like? And he said, well, the bees look like they're soaking wet, which is a sign that they've suffocated. And I asked him, I said, uh, did you install them as soon as you got them home? And he says, well, actually, my friend picked them up and stored them in his basement for two or three days because I was out of town. Not a good idea. Get your bees home 
get them set aside, you know, set right beside the hive you're going to install them in. Open the entrance. Not a bad idea. Throw a veil on or what have you, because sometimes the bees can be a little antsy. You know, they've been trapped in that, that uh, nuke. But put your veil on. Open the entrance. You know, if you wait 10 or 15 minutes, the bees will be calmed down enough to, uh, to install them. I know some people wait till the next day or whatever. And it, once again, I mean, it's your personal preference, but uh, you don't have to wait that long if you don't want to. I mean, just, just you know, throw, uh, <laughs> put them in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a little bit later. Okay, so let me get back to here. Let me get back to this video. And uh, let's see. Okay, so that's all I was kind of explaining here is just make sure that you orient the entrance of the nuke with the colony entrance or the box that you're installing the colony into. Um, you know, once again, this is a perfect time. Get your smoker started. Uh, give them just a puff of smoke on the entrance. And, you know, that should be more than sufficient. Another thing that uh, another thing that's really important is our nukes. Fortunately, we are known for having very strong nukes. Here's a perfect example of that. And so, when you take the lid or take the top off your nuke, and if you have a bunch of bees on the on the top like that, you want to make sure that you knock those bees directly into the hive that you're installing them into. Because every once in a while you get a queen, a queen bee. Uh, the queens are loose in these nukes. Uh, the brood that is in the nuke is from that queen. Uh, so, you know, you're not looking for a cage queen or everything. This is just a colony. It's ready to go. All it needs is space. And so you want to knock those bees into that hive just to make sure that uh, that queen is not going to get lost and and so that's you know and all you have to do here i'm gonna you don't have to be overly gentle just just knock them in there and then you can progressively start just taking the frame one by one and installing them in the box a key part of installing the nuke when you're doing this Make sure that you put the frames in the hive that you're putting them in. Make sure you put the frames in the same order that they were in the nuke. Uh, a perfect, and the reason you're wanting to do that is because bees naturally have a, uh, let me see here if I can find a picture, uh, honeybee colony uh, layout. I'll see if that kind of gives me what I'm looking for here. Um, honeybees, by their nature, well, even, even, these, even these pictures here kind of give you an idea of it. Uh, they're going to have brood in the very center and then pollen on the outside. And then furthest away is going to be your honey. And so what will happen is if you have all the brood, say those three frames in the center are brood frames, and you you know, just because you get caught up and just enjoying the bees, looking at the bees. If you happen to take one of those middle frames with brood and put it on the outside, the bees are going to move back into the center and are going to leave that frame behind because once again, it's just their instinct. And so that brood is going to be at risk at ch of chilling overnight. And then obviously, you know, brood that chills dies and uh, you know you don't want that. That can really set your colony back. So just uh, just make sure that you're putting them in the same order that uh, that they are in that nuke. Now let me get back to the get back to the video here. Come on, come on, come on. There you go. Uh, bear with me here, as I I probably should learn to be a little bit more proficient on this Zoom than what I actually. Currently, am. Here we go. Okay. So let me see here. That's it falling there. One by one. And so that's really the, and, the whole uh, point I'm making there is oh, just yeah. to make sure that you put them, put them in uh, in the same order. Okay. The other thing that oftentimes happens 
is that people will ask me, well, we installed the nuke and we didn't see, we didn't see any, or didn't see the queen. Queens are one of those weird magical creatures that can disappear right in front of you. It's the most amazing thing. I've been keeping bees uh, for 23 years, commercially for around 15 years. There are some times where I cannot find a queen, even in a nuke, um, especially the carnelian queens because they're darker, so they're, they're easier to hide. The thing you want to look for when you get your nuke is, you know, pull the frames and look for eggs. If you see eggs, then you know that there's an active queen in there. And uh, I've got a picture. Here's what your, here's what your eggs should look like. They look like little grains of rice. A great tip if it's sunny, <laughs> which hopefully, hopefully in the spring we're starting to get sunny days. If it's sunny, put the sun to your back and let the sun shine into the comb that you're looking at. And that makes it a little easier to see those eggs. Um, you know, if, if, there's, if you have a black foundation like here, it's a lot easier to see those eggs. But uh, you know, if you have the light colored, it's harder to see them. But anyways, that's what you're looking for is little grains of rice. And uh, that's, if you see those, you know the queen is active and uh, just just let them be obviously no pun intended in that that, com that comment but uh yeah you kind of see some of the eggs there but anyways yeah so you just go ahead and put all of the frames in there and then once again make sure that that box because there can be little clusters of bees that are hiding and everything make sure that nuke box is empty uh, we're not going to have the same issue with the pro nuke, but with our older style nukes, you can get bees that hide in the corners there. And you just want to make sure that that gets all shaken out just in case the queen happens to be there. So that's really it. And then the, uh, the other thing is, you know, if you want to feed your bees, um, usually our nukes come with at least a frame, frame and a half of feed honey in them. Uh, but it's not a bad idea, especially, uh, especially if you're starting with a new foundation, which is foundation that has not been drawn out yet. Uh, let me see here. I know it's just always helpful to have a, have a visual. You know, most of your frames, especially in these starter kits and everything, are going to come like this. There's no, there's no comb built on that. When you feed bees they are stimulated to build wax. And so it's, it's another really good tip. If you're feeding your bees, you can get that wax drawn out. And then uh, by the time you start getting into our area's honey flow, which is usually your blackberries, that's, that's kind of our major honey flow, which you know starts what, end, uh, in middle of June, end of June. Um, there's gonna be a higher probability of you getting honey that you can actually harvest. Uh, if you've been feeding them syrup, they're able to build out that comb instead of having to wait for our natural honey flow and use that to build out comb. So that's kind of a kind of another little tip there. Um, let's see, okay. One other thing here, and then I'm gonna to get to your guys' questions. And, and by the way, let me do a, I, I love and much prefer talking in person because you can kind of get an idea, you know, is this information making sense? Am I going too fast or what have you? But uh, uh, can you guys just give me a quick little feedback here on, is this making sense? Is this helpful so far? Yep. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Good, good, good. Can I, I ask a question? What type of feed are we giving them right away? No, that's a good question, Ryan. Uh, so for the spring, I would just do a one-to-one, -one, one part sugar, one part water. Uh, another thing that's actually good to add into that, uh, into that syrup is apple cider. Apple cider vinegar, it's really good for their gut health. And that 
ends up being about a tablespoon of apple cider per gallon. So, I mean, if you're giving them a quart, I, you know, I'll let you do the math on that, but uh, just one-to-one, one-to-one's fine. Uh, you can do it thicker. Uh, one of the issues you can run into with a one-to-one syrup, if we get a cold snap, say, and the bees aren't able to utilize it quick enough, a uh, one-to-one syrup is more apt to develop like fungus or mold and stuff, which you know, just gets gross. But uh, yeah, just one-to-one should be fine. One other thing that I want to make mention of on the state level, and I know all of us absolutely love regulations, <laughs> is uh, by law here in the state of Washington, uh, you are required to register your bees. And if you go, let me uh, share my screen again here real quick so you can see what the proper, proper website is here. Uh, Washington Beehive Registration. So yeah, if you just put in Beehive Registration Washington, uh, this is what the website looks like. And for, I think it's one to four hives, it's like five bucks or something. And what's really neat is that the state, our state, as well as the Washington State University is incredible at funding continue, continued bee research. And so it's one of those things that you know, even though none of us usually find it overly exciting to have to pay for permits and fees and all that, uh, in our state, it is the law. And then that money also goes towards helping some great, uh, great research programs. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, as Martha Stewart would have said way back when. Okay, let's get to the questions here. So this is from Fred, and that is, uh, one question about whether it's okay to use, well, that's kind of a fall question. Actually, this was sent back in, oh gee. Sorry, Fred, this was a question sent back in November 1st. So hopefully you figured it out by now. Uh, in our area, you really don't have to insulate your bees for wintering. The big thing is just to make sure that they're not, there's kind of a windbreak. Uh, ironically, if you go to our YouTube channel, we have a nuke that we follow through a season. The one nuke is just went through its second winter. It's looking great. And it's out in the middle of our field. I mean, it's, the lid was terrible. I mean, the lid was cracked. I mean, all of the things you're not supposed to do, but the mite levels were good and the bees were getting good nutrition. And this is their second successful wintering. So. Uh, once again, mites, mites, and, uh, and nutrition. That's really so important. Okay, here's some questions from Todd. Uh, once again, do you recommend treating for mites right away or waiting for the colony to build and do a wash? Once again, personal preference, just make sure if you don't treat your bees after picking them up, whether it's from us or anyone else, make sure end of July, beginning of August, you hit them. If they're still making honey, let them pull the honey that you want, let them have the rest and treat them. It, it is well worth it to sacrifice any type of production, honey production, to make sure that you get that treatment in. Uh, first week of August is, is your key time. Um, and that's, you know, what do you recommend for treatment during the summer? Same, same thing, end of July, beginning of August, I would use Apovar would be my suggestion. Um, as we get later into the year, we'll do one of these on mite treatments because you know you have oxalic acid, you've got uh, formic acid, you've got a bunch of different hops guard, um, but the most consistent one we found, and, and we could spend 20, 30 minutes just talking about just the different studies that have come out, very interesting findings on the different effects uh, and the different efficacies that these mite treatments have. However, just especially if you're just beginning, I would just stay with the Apovar, uh, just to be, keep it simple, it's the most consistent thing. Um, okay, uh, do you recommend supplemental feed for your nukes? If yes, Paul and Patty, question mark. 
you don't have to worry about pollen patties in the spring. Um, if you want to get technical, say that, you know, your bees are building up and all of a sudden, you know, in the middle of April, we get two weeks of horrible, rainy, cold weather where the bees can't fly, can't do anything. Your pollen, pollen in general, is your bees protein source. Syrup, honey, you know, uh, nectar is your bees carbohydrates source. So if they're just starting to build up in the spring and we get like just a couple of weeks of horrible weather, if you have pollen substitute in the hive, they're not going to register that all resources have cut off from the outside. They're still gonna have access to pollen, a pollen substitute, but it's still gonna to register to them that they have a protein source. If you're feeding them or if they have feed, they have a carb source and so they'll continue to build up their colony. But that's so rare that I, I the main time you wanna worry about giving pollen sub is in the late summer, fall, when you're prepping your bees for winter. And you know, once again, uh, we'll talk about that more later in the year. Uh, we, we address that actually on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you go on there, uh, there's different playlists and uh, you, can, you can find that. Okay, here's another one. I lost my first hive to wasps. I put a bunch of wasp traps under that, but it didn't work. I finally reduced the entrance, but it was during the flow, so hampered the bees getting in the hive. The wasps ultimately won even after hours of standing by the hive day after day with a fly swatter. What do you recommend for wasp control? Obviously in the spring, that's not gonna be an issue. I would venture to say that probably nine times out of 10, wasps can infiltrate your hive or hornets can decimate your hive only if there's something that's already compromised the colony health. Um, if your bees are strong and healthy, they are usually able to defend themselves. Once again, you know, there's gonna be that outlier case. We had a bee yard where we had curious cows and a bunch of cows ripped the tops or the lids off of some of the hives. And that large of a surface area exposed those colonies did suffer a lot from wasps and hornets, even though they were healthy. But if you just have a normal entrance uh, and your bees are healthy, you shouldn't have any issue with that. But I know how heartbreaking that is, and I hope, I hope you have better luck this year. Uh, one thing that is a good idea uh, is if you put out swarm, or not swarm traps, if you put out like wasp traps or whatever in the spring, there's a higher probability you're gonna be catching the queens, which obviously, you know, that's gonna keep you from having, or it's gonna minimize the amount of wasp hornet colonies that you have. So that's kind of a good idea. Daryl asks, I've tried to buy a miticide online with Amazon and get a message saying they're unable to send it to a customer in my location, Fox Island. You know where I can get a product to treat for mites. I've, I've seen that too. Um, usually, I think Apovar, if you try to order it from Amazon, it'll give you that warning. If you order it directly from Man Lake or Dadent, uh, or I mean, there, there's a bunch of different beekeeping supply places, but for whatever reason, um, Amazon does put that warning on, on Apovar, might even do that on some of the other mite treatments. So just, just buy it directly from a beekeeping supply place. That'd probably be your best uh, best bet. All right, let's see here. Damon has a question. Will this class be recorded and available on YouTube? Yes, yes it will. Uh, Josiah says, what should I remove from a dead hive to prepare for a new nuke and a proper way to install a nuke? That's a really good question. It's a very common question. Um, is, you know, can you, can you use, you know, if your bees die, can you reuse it? Let me show you a picture of really the only, one of the only uh, uh, exceptions that I can think of is if you, American Falbrut, 
if you ever find anything that looks like this in your hive, um, then you definitely do not want to use that. You want to burn that equipment. But the, the wonderful thing that's happened here recently is that you can buy these little, they look, <laughs> yeah, we all, we all have probably had experience by now with the little self-test COVID, you know, doohickey uh, test kits. And it looks exactly like one of those. Uh, you can buy them once again from any really of the beekeeping supply houses, uh, American Fowl Brood Test Field Kit. Uh, here it is right here. Um, you can use these and I would definitely suggest that if you suspect that your bees may have had this, invest the 16 bucks or whatever to get this test and make sure that it's positive before you destroy your equipment. Because uh, there is some, you know, a common, a common disease that we see, and we were seeing it in some of our bees this year because we missed knocking those mite loads down in the fall the way that we're supposed to. Uh, you'll see, uh, was it parasitic, whoops, parasitic, I'll still come up, parasitic mite syndrome. So it's black comb we're looking for? Yeah, black comb and then just, you know, and here's the other thing too, is that really AFB is going to make a colony collapse earlier in the year. When you have colonies that collapse around November, um, you know, or February, that's usually due to mites. Uh, another, you know, thing would be obviously queen failure, but most of the time it's, it, it's mite related. Here's this parasitic mite syndrome. And as you can see, it can kind of look similar. And so once again, this is where, and I want to encourage all of you that one thing that we really, really try to do here is give resources and always be available, whether it's through email, text. Um, Chris, who probably many of you have talked to, handles the new quarters. Uh, if you send her pictures, I'm more than happy to look at them. A lot of times she can identify what went wrong, but I'm more than happy to look at them too and get back to you. So anytime throughout the year, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We want this to, you know, be an ongoing relationship, not just kind of a, you know, thanks, thanks for buying your bees from us and good luck. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but short of really AFB, American Fowl Brood, you can reuse your, you can reuse your equipment. Um, let me see here if I can find the, the biggest thing you want to do is mm. get the dead bees, you know, brushed out of your equipment. Just gonna see if I can't find uh, using. Let's see here. We've got a YouTube video that we did. Okay, here it is. Let me share my screen here real quick. Uh, so yeah, make sure your dead bees are just brushed out of it. Uh, good idea too. You know, a lot of times the frames will have mold on them, mold on them, or uh, you know, just kind of nasty looking stuff. You can scrape the mold off. Here's, here's that video we did. I mean, here's, here's a perfect example. This mold here on the corner, I wouldn't be worried about. The bees will clean that up. But any mold on like the wood surfaces or whatever, you can just use your hive tools, scrape that off. And they're gonna be, they're gonna be fine. I mean, that comb there, uh, the bees are gonna be able to clean up and reuse. So yeah, just uh, you know, make sure, and there's our terribly messy shop way back when it's it's since gotten more organized thank goodness but uh but yeah no that's that's really the big thing just get the dead bees out of there um and just make sure the combs dry out you can just put them in your garage or what have you just put them in a place where mice rats can't get to them okay grant here's my question after treating for mites and a healthy hive and feeding there were a few hundred dead bees at the entrance until winter but when I checked in January, the hive was empty with a few dead bees on the comb, plenty of food. How do I determine what happened? I wouldn't put another batch in there even if I froze the frames. Uh, okay, dead bees, 100 dead bees in the entrance to winter, but then I checked in January, the hive was empty. 
whenever you're checking your bees and the hive is empty, I mean, it was, you know, colony collapse disorder is one of the, uh, what's happened is the mite, and, and bear with me, because I know, you know, if, if you're with us here right now, Grant, I know you, you said that you treated for mites already. And actually, if you're, uh, Grant, are you, are you here? I am. <clears throat> what time of the year did you treat? <clears throat> I treated in um, like early August. Early August? I'd harvested honey and then, yeah, early August, maybe as late as the 15th. What did you, <clears throat> what did you use for your treatment? The Abavar. A pad. He's, there were, came with two pads and I put them in end to end. So like one for either a week or two weeks and then the other one for either a week or two weeks after that. Okay. So it might have, so you did one strip, one strip for two weeks and then another strip for two weeks? Right. Okay. So I know usually with Apovar, I know with formic acid or the Mitoway quick strips, they'll give you that option where you can use one pad at a time. The Apovar, they usually suggest to put two, two strips per box. Um, so that might have been where it went did you did you do any type of uh, count on your mites i did beforehand um but then I, afterwards i just figured well that was my treatment so i let's let it go and 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 no judgment from me because if you heard my introduction you know i mean i i did the same same mistake and it's <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, I mean, you know, 500 colonies later, it's like, oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah, I should do, you know. Um, what I would suggest this year, your treatment a little bit later than, than, you know, comfort, but probably the biggest thing would just be try and uh, make sure to do the two strips per box of the Apovar. And then the, um, and then do a mite count. And the best way to do that is just through the, uh, the alcohol wash, which you're familiar with that, Grant? The alcohol wash. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, yeah, because they've uh -huh. got this, uh, the same company actually that does Apovar uh, plastic alcohol, uh, has made this really cool, contraption that you can buy that uh, makes checking for mites real or doing the alcohol washes really easily. Um, let me show everyone else here. Here it is. Oh, and this is Amazon. Once again, you can buy you it. You cut out earlier. Try that again, Grant. Yeah, you, you cut out a little earlier. Did you say put to treat each of my, I had two deeps. Should I treat both of them? Or just was one okay? Uh, you want to treat both of them, and yeah, two okay. two strips per box. Two strips per box. I got it. Okay. Um, and then after after that treatment's done, do an alcohol wash with this, and and we'll you know like I said we'll do. I think I actually do have a YouTube video on how to do an alcohol wash, but we'll we'll do another one here as it gets that time of the year. But uh, you just double check those mic counts because once again. You know, that's exactly what, where we went wrong. And it's, you know, once again, just comes back to that thing of mites and nutrition, especially the mites part. Oh, gee, sorry. I thought I'd share the screen here. This is the mite uh, thing that I was talking about here. Uh, and you can get that from anywhere. I mean, 23 bucks is pretty common. It's usually within oh, the yeah. 20. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. usually in the $25 mark. I saw somebody else to ask a question, really good question. Can you use Apovar year after year? And the answer to that is that you can, but it's best to use other treatments, excuse me, that will kill any type of mite developing a resistance to it. And I, there's some really fascinating research that come, that's come out about that and ways to use oxalic acid. But the big problem is there's a lot of people who will try and use oxalic acid in the late summer 
but oxalic acid does not do a good job as long as there's capped brood present. Uh, the apivar, without, you know, like I said, I, I, this is a really important topic, but at the same time, I'm also wanting to watch our, watch our time here. Uh, the apivar stays active in the hive for 42 days. So it's able to get, you know, if there's mites that are in that capped brood, at least, you know, the, the apivar is active enough that it's going to kill those. Oxalic acid, um, the way most people apply it, the way that we apply it in the winter is through sublimation or, you know, fogging of it. But when you do that, it only stays active in the hive for about two, three days. And so, um, you know, one of the things you can do to overcome that is treat them every two or three days. But that obviously gets labor intensive, even if you just have a handful of hives. Um, but yeah, that's a very important point. Yes, you do want to use a treatment other than Apivar. But just for the sake of kind of the 101 part of this class, uh, just focus on making sure that you do a really good treatment with Apivar the end of July, beginning of August. And then we'll start talking about what else you can do to make sure you're getting rid of any mites that are developing a resistance. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, okay, so a couple more questions here, and then uh, I'm more than happy to throw it open here for a couple of questions from those of you on here, and then we'll do the giveaway real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. Here's my question, when to start feeding and mite control? Once again, uh, you know, as soon as you get your bees, feel free to feed them. It's just going to help them build out that comb, especially if they're building out new comb on plastic foundation. And the mite control, once again, personal preference um, on whether you want to treat the nuke after you get it, simply because it'll have been treated by us about two or three weeks before, before they're distributed. But, you know, once again, better safe than sorry. I mean, it's, it's really, okay. Oh, this is another question from the fall that got mixed up in here. Let's, I uh, want to throw it open here for, um, uh, but I'm trying to figure out if you don't mind, if you have a question, throw, just, just put Q, put the letter Q in the, um, in the uh, text here and I'll call on you. Cause I know in the past, one of the first ones I did with this zoom class, I opened it up for questions and, uh, you know, it kind of got into a jumbled mess. So let me see here who the first taker is Mitchell Smith, Mitchell, go for it. So I have two questions. Sure. Uh, told that if I put my um, bees in the city and they pollinate with rhododendrons, that I would get honey that would make me high. Mm -hmm. So um, is that true? And then um, the second question is: um, Should I have more than one hive if I if I get a nuke? If I mean, how I, I see your little uh, diagram, I have. I have two supers, um, you know, two supers. Is that enough for one year or should I get more or what should I get? Uh, yeah, no, this, so on the rhododendron, I don't know what the, I mean, that is a kind of a well-known thing that pure rhododendron honey, what I was going to say, I don't know what the percentage is of the honey that has to be rhododendron. Uh, we've got a, uh, a bee yard that uh, uh, is close to a you know rhododendron nursery, and we've never had any issues with it. So, like just within the city, you know, the odd bush here or there, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about it. I I wouldn't worry about it. Um, you know, if you want to be safe, you can always just try a little bit to start and you know see if you have any effects, but. Um, the rhododendron issue comes out of, uh, I'm trying to remember what country, uh, I think it was, anyway, I was actually just watching a documentary on this, but it has to be a really high concentration of it, and then it has been known to make people sick or high, you know, whatever, whichever. Um, it's a good idea to have, I would say, have at least, have at least 
three boxes. And I'm thinking deeps. I'm thinking deep boxes. So if you're using mediums, you know, kind of the space that three, I mean, so maybe you want, you know, a minimum four mediums available. Uh, ideally, I would say have four deeps available. Uh, your nuke, even if you get it, you know, depending on when you ordered it, I know people who are ordering now are probably going to get their nukes later in April, maybe. I'm not sure if we're into the beginning of May yet or not. I'd have to ask Chris. But uh, even if you get your nukes later, like end of April, beginning of May, they're easily going to fill up two deep boxes. And so depending on the honey flow and everything, it's a good idea to have that third, uh, but especially, you know, fourth, four, four boxes per, per colony would be ideal. Appreciate the questions there, Mitchell. Alan, use up next. Hi, uh, Kevin. Hey, uh, last year, uh, last spring, we got our nuke from you, and um, it uh, was very strong. Uh, um, it, uh, there were two swarms that uh, not to die, uh, three, my wife says. And uh, anyways, um, how do we uh, prevent this? Um, they were, the swarms went way up in tall trees, so we couldn't recover anything. And uh, the other thing is we got a, we have one of these flow hives, but nothing seemed to be, they didn't seem to do any activity up in the flow hive. So we didn't get any uh, honey last. So I don't know if anybody has experienced these flow hives. Uh, yeah, it, it, so last year was weird for swarms. Um, we, and most of my colleagues that I talked to were experiencing that too. So it was just something with the weather. Um, really the best, you know, I always tell people that swarm prevention is best to, it's best to start swarm prevention before the bees start thinking about swarming. Uh, and the way you do that is when you get your nuke, just make sure that you get it installed and make sure that they've got room to expand. Um, the tricky thing, especially when you're uh, just first starting, starting with bees and you have that new foundation, plastic foundation, bees will sometimes rather swarm than actually work that foundation. And so sometimes you'll get bees that every hot hive, every colony kind of has its own personality. And sometimes just the, the thought, I say that loosely, just the thought uh, for the bees of building out those new frames and building into the wax is enough to make them swarm. It's kind of a strange, strange thing. But, uh, but yeah, it, it was a weird year last year for swarming. And so don't, uh, don't think necessarily it was something, something that you did bad. Uh, you know, maybe it was, you know, something that you did, but also too, we just had, uh, it was just a weird year for swarming last year. Uh, what was the second question? It was about uh, flow hives. We, uh, yeah. we have a flow hive and nothing was, no honey was put up in the flow hive. But the were flow hive is one of those, I've talked to a few people who have used them and that's a pretty common result. Um, it's funny, I actually came across an article in some, I remember it was a bee journal or newspaper back from the early 1900s. And it was literally, they were describing a flow hive. And so I think it's one of those things, your bees, I can see it working, but you would have to do a lot of manipulation to make it, to make it work. Um, there's, uh, yeah, it, it's just not a natural thing for the bees to want to go up in there and work that, those plastic cells. Um, it, can, it can work, probably the best thing to help them with that is to get them really strong. And then also just to have a really heavy honey flow so that they're just kind of push themselves into, you know, the actual flow hive itself. But no, that's a very common struggle with it. And it's, it's a really cool idea, but once again, it, it's something the bees are sort of reluctant to, 
reluctant to use, you know, but uh, anyway, thank you, Alan, for those questions. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. Todd, uh, you're up next. And then, uh, well, we've got time for one or two more questions. Then we'll do these giveaways real quick. Yeah, I was wondering uh, if you recommend marking the queen from your nukes uh, when you first get her, should we let them settle and before we mark them? Uh, my first question. Second is for these overwintered queens, do you recommend requeening in the fall? I, yeah, I, <laughs> it's kind of a funny discussion and I might step on some toes, but you know, whatever. I mean, I, it, it, you know, I don't think it's, anyway. Um, it's kind of funny because I know in our, in our personal operation, our colonies, our operation runs best when our queens are one year or less, uh, ideally less, but you know, one year being the maximum amount of time that we allow a queen to exist in our operation. The reason this is funny is because, you know, there's a lot of advertisements you'll see about vetted overwintered queens, you know, uh, and, and I think most of the people who are doing that are, they mean well, but especially we're seeing, we've seen a drastic decline over the last several years of the length of time, the lifespan of queens. And there can be various factors for that. I mean, the neonectide thing seems to be, you know, kind of in that mix as well. But yeah, it, it's definitely best to requeen every year, if at all possible. Um, that's, that's definitely, yeah, definitely ideal. And Todd, my apologies, I forgot your first question. I addressed the second one. What was the first one? Uh, if we're if we see the queen when we're installing nukes, could we mark her okay. then, or should we wait? I would. Uh, it, it's probably a. Well, you know what? Because it's an established nuke, you could probably mark her right away. Um, I don't think that would really cause any issues. Wouldn't hurt to wait either. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't see it causing any issues to do it right up front, but, uh, if you're wanting to play it extra safe, I'd probably wait, you know, wait a week or so until they're in their, you know, new home. Uh, cause you know, bees, you know, a bee colony really is like a, an organism itself. I mean, it's, it's literally this, you know, group of little individuals like our body or whatever else. And so obviously, whenever you're doing work with them, the more you can minimize stress to the organism or the organization, obviously the better. So hopefully that helps, Todd. But I can kind of see it either, either way. I don't think it'd make that big of a difference. Um, okay, Brooke, I just saw there our flow hive has worked great. We got many jars of honey at two harvests. Uh, Brooke, if you got a minute, and you don't mind me putting you on the spot, Anything in particular that you found? Because I know a lot of people use flow hives. Anything in particular that you found that was uh, helpful in making them move up into the flow hive, or did there not seem to even be an issue with that? I think ours was pretty much dumb luck. It was our first. They they did two years. Um, the first year we just got a little bit of honey. We left most of it for them. The second year. We harvested twice, um, but we did lose them because of mites again, just like you guys last year. Um, so that was our fault, but uh, we did not put a, another super in between. So we just had the uh, one deep and then the flow on top. So I think that's why they did so well. Yeah. Um, I think this year we would do, you know, if they got stronger, we would put another box in between just for them to have over winter and then Put the other the flow right on top of there but that's we're just experimenting pretty much um, at this point but we did get a ton of honey and it and they seem to do fine with it so that's it well you know what and it seems to me you know, this might be a false memory but, but it seems to me that i remember someone else that had success with the flow high of saying the same thing and where my mind goes you know because people will ask and this is a conversation you know or thing that we can talk about later in the year people ask 
what do you use queen excluders? What's your uh, ideas on queen excluders? And if you're going to use queen excluders in honey production to get a really efficient uh, honey or to get a hive to produce at its maximum, you want to put the excluder above the first deep or the first box. Um, otherwise, if you put it above the second box, the bees will be reluctant to cross over that excluder into the third box. They, they still will, but you're going to see a drastic cut down in honey production. And so it makes sense. It'd be the same thing with the flow hive. Uh, I think probably you just have to, a person, have to be careful to watch for swarming. Uh, I've been threatening to get one just to play around with it myself and experiment. Uh, Brooke, really appreciate, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Mike asks, can you describe how to requeen? I, I will do, I actually have some YouTube videos on that. If you search, uh, and let me actually just see if I can get that real quick and I'll put it in the comment section and then we'll do these giveaways real quick. And once again, thank you all so much. Please, uh, if you think about it, shoot me an email and let me know, you know what parts of this was helpful. If there was parts that could be better, uh, we're always wanting to always want to get better at anything that we're doing. Let me see here. Uh, high five bees. I'm going to have to search a little bit, a little bit deeper for it. Uh, once again, it's one of those topics that you know you can do it a multitude of different ways. And uh, it's it, it 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 really does kind of deserve its own own little talk, but I appreciate the question, Mike. Uh, when you say put queen excluder on first box, do you mean the bottom box? Very important clarification, Cindy. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I mean. Queen excluder above the first box or the bottom box. Um, that again. Using excluders is a conversation and discussion all to its own as well, because like I said, it, it does increase the risk of swarming if you haven't set the bees up properly and how you set the bees up properly is, you know, it, its own topic. Um, and like I said, I want to, we always try to do these on a regular basis. Please make sure to check out the YouTube channel as well. Uh, and uh, anyway, okay, so the way we're going to do this giveaway, and this is a first, so we'll see how well this works. I want to do three giveaways. First giveaway is this cute plush honeybee, or uh, bumblebee honeybee. I have no idea what breed it is, but it's cute as all get out. And then I've also got a couple of books here that I want to give away. Well, actually, a beekeeping journal, and then that uh, other book that I was talking about, the beekeepers. Problem solver, a hundred common problems explored and explained. Actually, it looks like a great book. I, like I said, I just leaf through it. So the best way I know how to, to do this is, um, you're gonna see here, this with the internet lag time and everything, this should be interesting. I'm going to ask a question and the first person, so put your, uh, Put your finger over the, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, I know, let's see. I'm gonna ask a question and you can put, it doesn't matter if you type in, you get ready to type in the comment section here. Like I said, this is the first time, so you know, trial and error. But here's my thoughts. I'm gonna ask a question. The first person that I see that's responded on the comment section with a period or a random letter number, it doesn't matter. It's kind of like using a buzzer. I'm going to ask you, okay, what's the answer? If you get it right, obviously you win the prize. If not, I'll go to the second person. And uh, so we'll just try this, see, see how it works. So here's the first question. Get your uh, symbol ready or whatever you're going to type in the comment box. And that is, in our discussion, what continues to be and has been the number one biggest enemy of honeybee survival right now? And Todd, I've seen, I seen, uh, I seen you the first one there. Todd, what is it? 
Roll of mites. Yes, sir, you got it. And fortunately, this this bee does not get varroa. So, <laughs> so Todd, if you can, uh, you know what? Let's see here. I'm going to put in my personal, what's the company, Kevin at HiFiBees.com. If you, Todd, can just email me your mailing address, or if you're local, if you want to pick it up, but if you want to just mail me your uh, mail address, and we'll get this in the mail to you. And we'll go with that. So congratulations, Todd. Cyber, uh, cyber applause. <laughs> okay, so let's do that. And I'll just make a note here. Uh, stuff the bee goes to Todd. Okay, so next giveaway is the book on, what's the official title here? The Beekeeper's Problem Solver. There we go. 100 common problems explored and explained. Okay, you know what? To, to change it up a bit, I'm going to pick the fifth person, the fifth person that gets their, uh, their digit or, or whatever else. And, and Grant, that is a very good clarification that the bites actually don't kill the bees. It's the viral issues. That, that's, that's very true. Very, very true. And a very important question. I... Grant, are you a lawyer or what? It's a good clarification, good point. Anyway, okay, getting back to this book giveaway. The fifth person that puts the symbol in there or whatever else is gonna be the winner. That, I don't know, just like I say, we're just kind of doing this random. Okay, so here's the question. What nutritional benefit does pollen sub provide? Pollen substitute provide. Is it, it's one of two options. We talked about syrup, we talked about pollen sub. Okay, one, yeah. two, three, four. Mike, it looks like you are the fifth one. <laughs> Mike, what does nutritional, what's the nutritional benefit that pollen sub provides? And kind of think in the nutritional, like what we need, need to survive uh, as a, a basic yeah. group. Yeah. Are you there, Mike? Oh, I'm here. Yeah. What's uh, What's the answer? Well, wax. I think. No. Nope. Uh, uh, nope, not quite. Like no. <laughs> the syrup. Hey, man, it's good guess. Answer. Syrup does help with wax production, but what is the? So let's go down one here. Uh, Ricky. Ricky Singleton. What is the, and I'm hoping I'm kind of framing the question right too here, but uh, what's the nutritional benefit? What nutritional benefit does pollen sub provide? Kind of a little hint. Remember we talked about the two nutritional things that are important really for us to live, for bees to live. The syrup provided one or nectar honey, and then the pollen sub or natural pollen provided the other. Ricky, or you want to give a guess there? Oh, Ricky, are you there? Ricky. Okay, Ricky, I am going to skip you here and go to Cassandra, which was above yeah. Mike. Just seems like the fairest thing to do. Cassandra, are you there? I'm here. What's your guess? Protein. Yeah, you got it. Protein, and the, here. <laughs> protein is what you get from the pollen or pollen sub carbohydrates from the syrup. Okay, Cassandra, did you see my email address down there? Here, I'll let me resend it. Cause just shoot me, uh, shoot me your mailing address. The Kevin one. Yeah, the Kevin at High Five Bees, and we'll get that. Uh, cool, hundred things B book. Okay, so last giveaway, and then we'll wrap her up. This, we just started carrying this in the store. Chris found this somewhere, and it's actually really cool. It's a beekeeping log book. I said journal, but it's a log book. And you've got all these different pages where you can track. Let me see here. You can't really see it. Anyways, you can track your hive's performance and just what they're doing. Uh, it's just really, really well done, and I think, can't remember what we're selling them for, but it's not really important here because we're going to give it away. So let's do the uh, third 
third person that uh, puts in their little symbol there or does their buzzer. Uh, last, the last question of the night, here it is. What is the male bee in a hive called? Third person, oh, got you there. Uh, da, 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 da. Can I make it? I'm not gonna give it to you again though. Duncan, looks like you are the third one here. Duncan, can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Duncan, what is drone? The, what is oh. the drone? drone? You got it, man. Cool. <laughs> you got it. Okay, so did you see did you see my email there? Or I can retype it. Um, I, I can get it. I've emailed you a bunch of times before, and uh, I'll be coming out to pick up a nuke so I can grab it then. Okay, yeah, no, totally up to you. I mean, if you if you want, we can mail it to you as well ahead of time, whatever it, uh, whatever works best for you. I put okay. my email on there, yeah. but- I'll, uh, I'll shoot you an email, I got it. Okay, no, thanks so much. Hey guys, thank you all so much for your time. I hope this was educational. One other thing before I go, really important, you're gonna get an email in probably about 30 or 40 minutes with a Dropbox link that has, oh, I can't even remember how many PDF B books in their educational books, as well as a bunch of educational PowerPoints. Yep. Uh, and this was generously provided to me by a gentleman in North Carolina. I can't even remember how we met, but uh, he did all these PowerPoints, all this work, and uh, you know, found out what I was doing, which is just wanting to provide it for free as a continued just value, uh, you know, to those of us who, uh, or for those who get nukes from us and stuff. Uh, so avail yourself to that. I don't have any plans of taking the link down anytime soon, but just, just in case I, you know, phase out in the next couple of weeks, whatever, uh, when you get that link, I would suggest just download everything, put it on your computer device, whatever, just so you have it. But it's a great, great resource, a lot of great stuff. You're going to see varying opinions on how to do stuff. But the only thing I'm dogmatic on is the mites thing. I mean, maybe I could think of a handful of other things. But the most important thing is the time that we treat for mites here in our area. Uh, that's that's something that is kind of yeah. non-negotiable. Other than that, have fun. Beekeeping is all about having fun and learning and just all of that uh, all that stuff so anyways thank you all so much i'll get this uploaded on youtube here in the next day or two as well and uh, you guys have a great great weekend thank you again